Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, M&T Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Stephen Napolitano, First American Title Insurance Company, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Urban American. So here we are, it's 2011. My apple seems to be getting a little shiny. I don't know where it's gonna be. How do, the, how do the banks, how do the guys who have the money, you know, as they said, Willie Sutton, why do you, why do you, uh, you know, rob banks? He says, that's where the money is. So why do these banks, where do they want to lend and who do they want to lend to? So I've brought four of them together. My guests today include Kevin Cummings, who's the president and the CEO of Investor Savings Bank. Greg Brocka, who's the regional president of TD Bank. John Cook, who's the executive vice president of M&T Bank. And last but never least, my friend for many years, Louis Capelli, who is the chairman and CEO of Sterling National Bank Corp and Sterling National Bank. So, Lou, you've been around banking a number of years. How do you look at 2011? Is this going to be shiny, or am I going to have to say it's getting a little rotten? Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about 10 first, and then we'll get to 11. Fine. Uh, we, we have been uh, lending through 10, 9, and we will continue to lend into 11. Um, we uh, are encouraged and optimistic about uh, 11. Uh, we uh, have different kinds of products in our commercial and industrial loan portfolio, which is a preponderance of our business. And we find some of the areas are absolutely booming. We have a staffing product, uh, temporary staffing, we do uh, payroll funding. Uh, that business uh, is up uh, double digits for us, double digits in the industry. And what gives us encouragement is that usually if people are, are hiring temps, ultimately they will hire permanent people. And then hopefully this 9% uh, uh, unemployment uh, will be cured. And uh, in one of our other businesses, uh, in factoring and uh, trade finance, our business is also booming. So I feel really good about 11. So, so you, you, but certain of those business, staffing, uh, payroll funding, are not traditional lending businesses. Those are service businesses. Oh, no, on the contrary. Uh, they're, uh, we're lending to service businesses. Oh, so, okay, so, oh, to, okay, so you're lending to those. I thought you were talking about, because I thought you run a staffing business. No, no, we lend to those businesses and we do back office functions for those businesses. Kevin, investors really didn't do any lending until like 2005, right? Right. And now, how large is your portfolio of lending? Our portfolio at, at year end is $8 billion. 
Yeah. And about three billion, 2.8 is in the commercial sector, 5.2 is in the old business, the residential business. You mean, when you say the old business residential, that was the one to four family homes? Exactly, yeah. And now of the $3.2 billion of commercial, where is that? Is that in only real estate or is that to lending to companies like Lewis does, uh, you know, lending to middle market companies? Where, where, where are you lending? Well, we focus recently on the multifamily space. That's a, it's a nice transition from a credit risk point of view, going from the residential to the multifamily. We got about a billion two in that, about a billion in commercial real estate, rental properties, almost about, about a, just about 100 million in, in lose business, the CNI business that we call it, and then about 350 in construction. In construction. Now, John, you, you've been around the banking world many years, and I mean, M&T, uh, I mean, New York City, your market, M&T, you did it close to $900 million in new loans in the fourth quarter. Correct. So you've been pretty bullish on 2010, and how do you, how do you and your, your team look at 2011? Well, I think we'd, like Lewis, I'd go back to late 2009 and 2010, and uh, if your powder was dry, it was a tremendous opportunity to do deals. And I'd say in the second half of 2010, what finally began to happen is more properties came out of the woodwork and began to be sold and lenders were in a position to, to take the haircuts and owners began to realize that they, they needed to unload them. And the real estate market has improved a little bit. And you kind of had a confluence of an awful lot of positive things that were great for a bank like ourselves, which would go in and and take a, uh, a project that didn't work at $100 million in debt, somebody takes the haircut and it works marvelously at 50 or $65 million as, in as debt. As long as it wasn't you who was taking the haircut. Uh, that's true. <laughs> but uh, we have an exceptional group that, uh, at uh, M&T Bank that uh, is basically a panel of experts that looks at the deals that come through and, and approve these deals and or disapprove them. And they've been with us for many years and they, they're all owners in New York City and have turned out to be exceptional performers. But you, in I mean, in addition to real estate, you have a middle market business. You're, you're, you lend to the middle market. I know you have some nonprofits. You have some healthcare business also. We do a big nonprofit business in the city. We do an awful lot of the clubs and the things like uh, an Alliance Francaise or a Jewish Community Center, that type of thing, interest us in, and the school business. Uh, in healthcare, most of that's done out of Westchester from our Tarrytown office. Uh, obviously in Buffalo and um, down in Baltimore, our, our bigger markets were very involved in a full range of uh, commercial and industrial loans for, for everybody. We're, you know, a kind of community slash regional bank in these markets. Which is a perfect lead into Mr. Braca. I mean, you, you're a bank uh, that, you know, if it's a good corner location, uh, you know, no one could miss a TD bank. But more important about TD is TD is one of the most well capitalized banks in the world. A very strong bank. And, and where, where do you see your market and where do you want to lend and who do you want to lend to? Uh, in 2011, Greg? Well, first of all, Michael, it's very nice to be on your show. And um, uh, yeah, you know, we've been very fortunate that, um, uh, you know, TD's been positioned unbelievably well, um, you know, right through this downturn. And uh, we've made no bones about it that um, we want to lend right through this. We want to lend smart. We want to uh, do business with our good clients. And we certainly want to continue to support all of our good clients. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, while the headline risk is around of all of the faults and all the problems out there, 90 plus percent of the market hasn't defaulted. 90 plus percent of the market continues to want to do the right thing and continue, uh, talking about businesses, want to continue to perform and add value to the economy and we want to make sure that we remain there. And in fact, uh, we've lent right through this and uh, when a lot of uh, our, even our existing customers have done the right thing and deleveraged uh, we've continued. Yeah, but you were bringing that out, which I think is a very valid point. You said, even though you wanted to lend, a number of your customers, and I think this was your general concept, wanted to reduce their loans. There's no question about it. We've seen uh, 
any whether it's even S&P, and this is not bank uh, centric to any one particular organization, that the, the market uh, emphatically had deleveraged. And that goes for consumers as well as corporations, medium and large, small, medium and large, uh, have deleveraged. And even in, in that fact, uh, TD has continued to grow, actually grow its absolute loan book right through 2008, 2009, and 2010. Uh, I, I would just say you asked the question about where do we uh, f uh, seem optimistic and where do we, uh, the spaces we want to lend. And we want to lend in all of our core businesses. We're growing out our retail our business of uh, mortgages and home equities uh, uh, tremendously uh, because uh, we, we certainly want to be there for our retail customers and do more there. Our small business, uh, we want to continue to lend uh, because we think that's the fabric of all the communities we do and support all of the networks around the stores and all the infrastructure we do around the stores. So uh, around the healthcare and not-for-profit business, we have a very uh, vibrant and large business around that and we see that as good business and again, fundamental to the communities in which we operate. And when it comes to middle market and real estate, uh, again, uh, you know, we're in those markets every day and uh, you know, we're going to continue to support our good clients. And, and you know, we chatted about this amongst us before we came on that, uh, you know, especially over the last four or five months since the fall, there's been this underpinning of uh, slow confidence building and we're hearing it from our customers. People want to invest again. Uh, so we're very confident about 2011. I mean, Lois, you know, the, the, the name of Sterling over the years, of the, all the years that you've been there, has been really geared to the middle market, to the small middle market company. Um, and the middle market is the, is the, is, is the fabric of, of the country and, and the market. But a lot of the big banks, and some of them very good friends of mine, you know, this is not something that J.P. Morgan is really into this market. Citibank isn't into this market. Uh, Bank of America is not really in this market. So isn't it a great time for all four of you over here to go into lending more to the middle market, into the into the commerce and industry, to the accountants, to the law firms, you know, to the brokerage houses and so on. It's fantastic time. And the reason why uh, the majors probably don't do it is the uh, amount of effort that it takes to move their needle. You know, make a lot of $5 million loans to get up to $100 million. So, you, so for, for them, making a $100 million loan to one entity is so much easier, probably less overhead. And so we're thankful for the fact that, uh, that they're not concentrating on this particular market. Another issue here in our market, if you, you draw a circle 50 miles around where we're sitting now, is probably the greatest market in the country and probably in the world so we don't have to travel very far to do our business. And we, we know the market, we know the geography, uh, we, we, we know most of the people that are in the market because we've been in the market so long, which gives us a great deal of, uh, of confidence to do business with them. So, so you, and I don't want to say the new kid in town, but in reality, even though the bank is well established, you are the new kid in town and you've grown your assets to $9 billion plus. Where do you, do you and this is a double-edged question. The regulators who, who basically say, we want you to make loans, we want you to be in the business, then they always have this other comment, but if you have too many loans to one specific industry, we're a little upset with you. You know, there's too much of a concentration. That, the, you know, so they like, they're going to say, you know, it's nice that you're doing construction loans, but maybe you should be lending to, you know, the little delicatessen over there, or you can be lending to the small retail operator. And in New Jersey, as we know, because these guys are in New York, the New Jersey office market isn't really good, and the economy has not really improved. That's why you've really been heavily involved in, in the real estate, right. multifamily, and as one would say, you've been poachers. You've come to New York City. You've, you know, a lot of the middle market lending mm -hmm. in multifamily has been in New York. So where do you see, you know, because these guys aren't going to let you... Like Put a new kids on the block, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we opened the loan production office on 42nd Street in uh, February. Hired a team out of a, a, a small bank, out of a fellow out of Wall Street, and we've done 300. We closed 360 million in uh, in 2010. Now, the average loan, mostly multifamily, uh, some commercial. Uh, but for the most part, average loan about three million dollars. So when you talk about the risk factors, you know you're spreading that risk over a lot, right. a you're, lot you're of, not, of people. You, you don't have, you don't have a concentration, concentration and things right. like that. The other thing is what Lou said. 
that five to $20 million loan that larger banks, really, that's an open space for a bank our size. And we can hopefully really make a great living being a niche player in that five to $25 million loan. Now, here's the interesting thing. TD, I mean, Greg's domain is like a $16 billion bank, while TD is a $600 billion bank. Uh, John's domain of M&T is probably about a $10 billion bank in this market, while M&T corporately is close to $100 billion, mm -hmm. especially after, uh, you know, the uh, Wilmington Trust deal. Over, over here. around 70. Seven. Okay, 70 now, but you'll be larger later. So where do you, <clears throat> I mean, what's the perspective? You know, you, you, you listen to you guys up in Canada, and they say, okay, Mr. Braca, you've, you've, you're really good in healthcare, you're good in real estate, you're good over there. But you know what? If we're opening up branches and other things, where are you gonna where are you gonna go to grow our business? Um, <laughs> I can go a couple places with this question, but I but I think quite f fundamentally for us, uh, we like to look at our operating model. And you mentioned some of the other folks out there, and this is not about the money centers or beating up on any of these guys, because quite frankly, these days it's it's just too easy. Um, but name me one organization or one great retailer that has ever fixed a broken model. Eventually they go away and they, be, they morph into something else. I don't know of one great, truly great story of a retailer, uh, a great retailer that truly fo uh, fixed a broken model. And if it does, it takes just a, you know, decades or more to do. Uh, so it's gonna be really interesting. And there is tremendous market share available given that the cities, the B of A's and the JP Morgans have just tremendous market share throughout one of the most important MSAs as far as wealth density and numbers of customers around. But the way we've organized ourselves is versus those guys is we've, there's no silos. So in, in my, myself and my counterparts are responsible for a geography. And it's very important to me, not just to grow healthcare and middle market, but small business I'm responsible for, retail, community bank. And we've got teams lined up with definite growth goals in 2011 about how do we grow those businesses and how do we truly get uh, capital and, and loans out to everything from small businesses right on up the spectrum. John? You know, I'm, I'm thinking about real estate. Um, people get carried away saying you got too much commercial real estate and too much real estate generally. And then it's, it becomes almost like a, you know, a swear word. But when you figure that people have to live somewhere, people need a piece of real estate to produce product in. Uh, in many cases, you need a piece of real estate to, uh, to go do your retail. And um, you need a piece of real estate for, for a hospital. I mean, real estate is everywhere, and it, it does become a very large piece of any portfolio. And I keep hearing it getting criticized, but if it's done properly, uh, it should be big. And I don't get too worried about that concentration. Sterling has a factor. Certain companies have factors. Certain right. companies have asset-based lending. I even think uh, when you were commerce, Commerce had a, an asset-based landing group down in part of Cherry Hill. We just hired a guy by the name of Barry Kastner, who was uh, uh, with several of the big banks and his team over, and uh, we're very much in the asset-based business now again. So you like the asset-based business? You think it's a, it's a market? Well, we think it's a good discipline. We think it's a good business. It's a space we want to grow. And quite frankly, uh, I, I do think it's very appropriate, uh, uh, whether it's you know wholesalers or distributors or uh, you know many, whatever manufacturers are left, uh, we do think it is a very good discipline for many small to medium-sized companies. Uh, in addition to partnering with the factors, right? There's a, still a space for the smaller companies that quite aren't bankable and partnering with the factors and lending in conjunction with the factors. So uh, we do think so, uh, that's so a you, good space. So you do what somebody might call refactoring, you know, with another factor, which Lou could probably bring out. Well, the amount of um, old line factors in number that are we can count on remaining. two hands. Exactly. And so the, the, the term factoring is misused. Uh, most of the small asset-based lenders call themselves factors, and they're not factors. The traditional O-line factor is, uh, is a company that buys the receivable, guarantees the receivable, collects the receivable, and uh, most of the other companies do not do, not do that. Uh, uh, one of the reasons, and it's just one of the reasons why uh, we have, uh, when we've been in it our whole, uh, our whole uh, life, is uh, that um, we know that business very, very well. 
uh, uh, we like it. It's very profitable business, very hands-on business. You need a lot of technology and a lot of people to do it, but it does pay off at the bottom at the bottom line. And in order to get into that business, it takes a great deal of expertise and a lot of a lot of investment. And so there are very few people that are going into that business. But it is a business that, that's been around, thriving. You know, it's, it goes back to the 1600s. Uh, it started in England when they were trading with the colonies. You know, it's, it's, two weeks ago, I was moderating a panel, and I had the CFO, COO of, uh, of uh, Kimco, the COO of uh, related companies, and basically one of the topics that came out of it was a topic with regard to syndicated loans. And, I, you know, I know we were talking prior to the show that you were saying that you have a syndicated uh, participation with John on certain things. Uh, the comment that this was made by the gentleman on the thing is they said, when a loan, when a syndicated loan goes bad and you have a lot of people in the syndicate, it's a nightmare. Uh, because, you know, maybe if they're from Germany or if they're from a different country and or Ireland and they're out of the business, it's not a, situ a good situation. Have you or do you see yourself, uh, and this is, you know, an open question for everyone over here, with larger loans to be done, do you see yourself perhaps syn being part of syndicated loans with let, other let banks? Me, let me respond. Let me respond to it. Sure. Because I've seen, them, I've seen them both and I've been at meetings with lots and lots of, lots and lots of banks. Uh, when you, when you, there's a difference between participating and syndication. Participating is usually one or two partners, people you know well, who you do business with, probably have the same mentality that you do. And when the loan, if the loan gets into trouble, you're probably going to agree on how to, to work that situation out. When you go into a syndication and there's multiple banks in it from all over the country, and particularly in the last couple of years where banks have gotten into trouble, you're, you're, you've taken your risk and you've doubled your risk because not only do you have to worry about the loan itself, but you have to worry about, about, the, the, bank who, about the bank who who has a different agenda than you have. So, and so syndicated loans are very dangerous to do and also regulators uh, look, on, look uh, upon them in an entirely different fashion. Now, I, but to do larger loans, because, you know, in, in, in the heydays, you know, there were banks taking $100 million loans. They were really going up to the level, to the high levels. Today, you know, you'll be very happy to do a loan with him because, because you know their mo modus operandi. Do you see that continuing? Because, you know, the market is getting yeah, well, better. Well, I, I like to add that I do think um, uh, Lou's 100% right in that um, I think what the last couple of years has showed us uh, understanding who your partners are in business is as important as ever. And it's reminded us of some very basic lessons. Make sure you know who you're in business with, right? Because it's only tested when things do uh, go the other way and uh, things will go the other way in different cycles. So uh, I do think that's a very important comment. But, um, you know, for our part, um, you know, we are focusing uh, middle market, upper middle market. Do we do some corporate work for our core clients? Absolutely. Um, are we, uh, you know, necessarily focused on the Fortune 100? Uh, not every day, other than in core spaces that fit some strategic alliances with our parent. But uh, there is a market for the syndicated loan business, right? It helps, uh, you know, corporate America. Uh, there is still an efficient way uh, to mitigate risk um, uh, over, over many, many banks. And when you get into the Fortune 500 space, uh, and that market has come back as far as volume, uh, there is uh, there is an effective way to deal with that on the debt side. Okay, but here's what what I'm I think you you both have answered it, and I know Kevin, mm -hmm. you really haven't done syndicated loans. Right. Here, so how large of a loan can you take, and how much lo how large of a loan would you be not how large you can take, how large of a loan would you be comfortable to take? I think in 2011 on your own books without any. Idea? We'll go loans to one borrower, up, you know several projects. Up to uh, sixty million. Up to sixty. Yeah, and then individual transaction, thirty million. We have a couple thirty million dollar loans on the books. Greg, you know, I'm sorry, but the, those that question actually gets very complicated because it really goes to 
who the borrower is, what do we ultimately right. I mean, view the risk I is. I mean, you have healthcare institutions at over $100 million. Uh, at over $100 million. So, so do we take risk in nine figures to a single name? Yes. Um, is that something that we say is our core market? I didn't say and it's core And I think when you get to the, to the real estate, middle market, ABL businesses, our sweet spot's going to be in that 10 to 30, 40 million. That's, I, think right? that, I think that's more of a better question. John? Right. We've done... Um, We've done a number of loans, well over $100 million, to good borrowers. And and we'll have a group credit exposure in excess of $300 million on but what, but what do you a feel variety comfortable? of projects. What do you but feel comfortable with? In the, last, uh, in the last couple of years, I think we found that syndication or club deals are, uh, are a necessary evil to an extent because you want to keep your powder dry a little bit for the customer. And secondly, it just makes uh, good sense not to risk too much on one asset, even if it's pretty good. So we're, we are tending to do less $100, $120 million deals and more take, uh, like say, out of 150, make maybe take 50 to 70 of that if it's a club deal or maybe even a little less. Lewis. Anywhere from one to 25 million. And what do you feel the most comfortable oh, with? Uh, uh, five to 15. Okay. So, so, you know, basically, you know, if, if I have to look at my apple, I could probably shine it a little bit more because I, I'm hearing a very optimistic approach. I think jobs are increasing. As you said, Greg, prior to the show, ever since the election, people have been feeling a little better. Uh, people are signing longer term leases. You know, it, it looks like the world is, is getting better. And I'd like to say that probably later in this season or the beginning of next season, I could bring all four of you back and uh, you'll give me your opinions. I'd like to thank Kevin Cummings, uh, Greg Brocka, John Cook, and Luke Capelli. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, M&T Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Stephen Napolitano, First American Title Insurance Company, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns, and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackel Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Sterling & Sterling, Urban American. Music